All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel White, and I am a board certified behavior analyst with the Center for Human Development at UAA. Our other presenter is Summer LaFay. She's a licensed social worker and a BCBA, also at um, the Center for Human Development. And today we are going to be presenting on visual supports. Um, so before we actually jump in and get started, I'm going to launch a poll. Um, and if you can see the poll, please answer in that poll. What is your relationship to individuals with autism? Are you a parent or caregiver? Are you a direct support provider, case manager, a specialist such as an SLP, OT, PT, another BCBA? Are you a self-advocate or do you have another kind of relationship to an individual with autism? Um, and once we uh, get started, um, everyone is muted. So if you have any questions um, that you would like to ask, you can type them into chat. We will allow time at the end for questions. If your question doesn't get answered, um, then that's okay. You can send me an email. Um, my contact information will be on the last slide, but it's Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at alaskachd.org. And we can answer any of your questions. Um, so it looks like we have parents, caregivers, direct support providers, and one at least one specialist um, for those that are attending um, via computer and can vote in that poll. Um, the topic today, as I said, was uh, visual supports, and we're going to jump in and get started. So I am going to let Summer um, go ahead and get started here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I appreciate um, people coming in the afternoon on Saturday. Those are pretty precious hours. Uh, I think we're talking today about something that I use pretty regularly in my practice and probably one of the most frequent antecedent interventions I use with teams, parents, and caregivers um, most frequently in my work. And I work uh, a little differently than um, Dr. White does. I um, work with complex behaviors and generally kids are a little older and then I work with adults. And often, as I said earlier, the most effective change that I can get teams to um, integrate the quickest are the use of visual support systems for multiple reasons. So I'm really excited to get to talk a little bit more about this today because I think it's a very, very important topic. And I look forward to questions or perhaps comments after um, Dr. White's presentation and my presentation to hear what kind of visual supports you might be using or considering using um, with your learner um, at home or as a support provider. So let's begin. Um, I'm going to go to the next screen. Thank you. Um, what are visual supports? It's a, it's a pretty simple question. Um, and I have to say that as you read through this slide, um, we are surrounded by um, visuals all the time. Uh, they're very, very effective. Um, many people learn better visually, not just children with autism, but humans um, learn better visually than they do um, just looking at words or hearing verbal vocal speech. Um, the kind of visual cues in our environment, um, most of you will probably agree, are um, nonstop if you walk into the grocery store or if you're driving a car, um, they help us establish the order of events. Um, they give us examples of expected behaviors for situations. Um, visual, visual supports are often international, bilingual, um, and that's really important to understand. They also, visual supports also include people that have any kind of hearing differences. 
And so it, it's, it's, it's a very big topic that we're talking about today. Um, visual supports we use every day in our culture specify what time something will happen. And often I find with learners related to maybe a challenging behavior, which is what I'm normally um, working with, there'll be something visual going on that might even be something we need to be aware of in relation to the challenging behavior. Um, so paying very close attention to what's going on in the environment that is visual and might be something that the learner is, is attending to that's other than what you want. So I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm challenging you today to think a little bit broader in relation to the visual environment. Visual supports might give us steps necessary to complete a task, and we're going to see some um, really great examples of that. Um, they're also pretty easy to make these days uh, with computer technology, or if you're kind of low-tech like me, you can make visual supports with glue and construction paper. Uh, I do that all the time. Visual supports can offer strategies for problem solving for learners. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about that because that's really one of the number one reasons I use visual supports is as an alternative method of prompting um, to um, get learners to engage in behaviors that are not dependent on verbal, vocal prompts from caregivers or parents um, and as kind of a strategy to work um, through some prompt dependency issues that occur pretty regularly in some of the learners and and people that I work with. Um, visual cues and visual supports might be used um, as a checklist or a self-monitoring checklist. We'll see an example of, of that and many more. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I'm, it's very possible we didn't cover them all. You want to move to the next one, Rachel? So the first bullet point there is, is the, the simplest reason. Uh, often visuals are um, better understood and it's very powerful information for your own learning and for the learning of the people or um, children that you support to know if that person learns visually very well. I'm not a particularly great visual learner, um, although I respond pretty regularly to visual information in the environment. Um, I use my hearing more than I use my sight. But visual information, we have good data, good scientific data. The visual information is processed um, more effectively and faster um, by many learners. So that's very important. And learners with autism may really struggle with auditory learning. And so that's a very important factor to consider. Um, when you're building an environment for someone to um, be successful and come in contact with learning, um, learning in an errorless way. Um, visuals also provide a permanent reference, and I can't tell you uh, how valuable that is. Um, if you're a mom or a dad um, or a grandparent or a family member, um, you might just actually experience a little bit of burnout from repeating your verbal vocal, vocal prompts. Um, a permanent reference is something that you can leave there and will always be in the environment and gives, gives the learner a reference um, other than someone telling them what to do. And also can improve flexibility with changes. So you can learn a system. You can learn a way of doing something rather than learning or memorizing a rule. Okay, go on to the next one. So one of the great things about visual supports, I use them in my own home and I use them with almost every behavior plan that I write. It can be used in natural settings. Um, you can use them in the community. There are signs all over the community. You can teach um, learners to observe the visual supports that are in the community. Um, I'll just tell you a really brief story about um, a, a woman that I worked with that was experiencing Ray syndrome. And so she couldn't form verbal vocal speech very well. It was very hard for people to understand her and her team who had supported her for some time um, didn't think um, she was processing information very well from the environment. And uh, 
uh, one of her caregivers was in the car one day and was able to make out some of the verbal speech she was she was um, making in the car and she was um, naming the street signs she was naming the different visual shapes for street signs and um, they figured out um, on their own that they needed to support her visually and they actually made a game of looking at the signs in the community and giving her a chance to approximate the vocal speech based on those visuals but she was just responding to the visuals in the in the community and they were just you know stop signs yield signs things like that um, but it was really quite funny um, that it took that um, for folks to figure out that she knew what they meant and um, she was paying really close attention to those visuals um, the other thing we all use um, calendars and appointments um, visuals um, allow learners to learn one of the most important things I think as they grow older is a schedule and routines uh, I can't tell you how often we're working on putting visuals in place to um, build a schedule for the learner um, for the learners team which helps the team visuals also help the team but eventually to shift the use of those schedules those visual schedules to the learner so they're growing in independence to-do lists, um, so that might be visual prompts used to um, help folks remember the next step or things to get done before something else needs to be done. Um, really common visual many people use are sticky notes. And another kind of list you might notice is a grocery list. Uh, a couple of other things that we use um, visually with a little bit older learners, I use a lot of um, thermometers for saving to practice saving up money to um, introduce concepts related to, to um, how much you need um, in a visual sense, not in a number sense, not in a numeric sense, to be able to get something you really want, um, to, build, to build a routine around saving, things like that. Um, and visuals increase independence. So use of visuals, use of schedules, um, can really help someone move from being more dependent on their caregivers for their immediate needs to um, you know maybe completing more steps in a task or um, a, a whole task and visuals if the routine is learned and they're successfully acquiring the ability to complete um, tasks you can fade visuals out they're pretty easy to to decrease the level of visuals in the environment next one so the biggest thing they do is change the environment. And for me, when I'm um, looking around, I am always looking at the environment and saying, what is the environment telling my learner? What is the environment? What behaviors are easy in the environment? And so using visual supports related to um, organization is are one of the first things we do, um, where things go things like that and they prompt behavior and if in my favorite kindergarten classes always have visuals to help the learners independently know where things go to establish an understanding a learning routine related to putting things away or where to get things um, another another reason that I um, use visuals as to support changing the environment is shifting a learner from outside um, external comments from caregivers to self-monitoring often when i'm creating some sort of self-monitoring um, device it could be really really simple depending on the age of the learner um, it could just be something as simple as um, an activity rachel will give you some examples later a picture of an activity and a sticker or something like that that allows a learner to indicate for themselves at whatever le level they are that they completed an activity or that they're engaging in an activity um, and that is incredibly important to shaping independence because you can build on those increase those and then eventually fade them um, although I personally engage in self-monitoring every day um, most of us do and we don't think about it as much um, and there and we use visual measures to do that so one good example um, of a visual measure that people use pretty regularly is a scale 
Um, so it takes data on your weight or a visual, a visual prompt. Some folks are using these days pretty regularly for, um, for fitness is something like a Fitbit. So you can look down and constantly get that visual of how well you're doing. Um, visuals, this is a really important one for, for me when I'm working with teams. They take the pressure off caregivers to use speech only interventions. Um, I'm, it doesn't seem like it today because I'm talking continually, but if there's one thing that I'm telling teams is you're talking too much. <laughs> We talk too much um, and we generally um, error correct and um, often correction, um, trial and error and error correction verbally has the potential under certain circumstances to reinforce challenging behavior rather than to teach the behavior you're trying to teach. Um, and so I work with caregivers sometimes to develop visuals like you will see today, or even to use themselves as a model, uh, a visual model, rather than to talk, um, to give the most immediate way for the learner to see the behavior or the next step um, that is expected of them. And to be frank, uh, I'm a, I'm a verbal person. Many of us in our culture are very verbal. We're more comfortable um, communicating through verbal speech often and so we use what we know but I do often find caregivers who are exhausted from talking and not only are they exhausted from talking the talking's not as effective and you can find situations where verbal prompts are used continually and turn out to be um, to be a factor in the development of prompt dependency um, the other thing that I, I cannot stress enough, they can supply needed structure for everyone. Often, um, if you have um, a person with disabilities um, or a child that perhaps is experiencing autism, they have more than one caregiver. And to keep the routine stable, to keep the expectations stable, to keep the tasks stable, um, the visuals can supply a structure that allows everyone to be closer to delivering the same kind of um, atmosphere and routine for the learner. And, and that is very important. Um, and it also allows you a historical record, um, a permanent product to go back and check, uh, I think. And that can be key um, to supporting a team um, working with um, a learner. You want to go to the next one, Rachel? Okay. Uh, look at me. You can see how I'm not a visual. I, I capitalize prompts and, and nothing else. Um, so realistically, when we're working with children, we inevitably make requests. Uh, but learning how to prompt and shift some of your prompting to visuals um, for what's needed often allows a person to learn what is an important skill all caregivers must. I can't, I can't see the whole, I don't know why I can't see my whole slide there. I'm a little confused by that. What did I do? Learning how to ask. Learning how to ask for what you want and need a person to do is important. And I think my point, because my slides cut off, is that understanding what kind of prompt you use is as important as understanding the use of visuals. Um, and I keep, I keep going back to we're most frequently using verbal vocal prompts. A visual prompt is a different kind of prompt. It's, a, a, as we said earlier, a more immediate prompt. But learning how and what you're doing regularly and routinely allows you to mix it up a bit, allows the learner to um, come in contact with different ways of accessing um, information from their environment and different ways to know when to engage in behavior. So that's very important. Um, we often use something called a prompt hierarchy when we're talking to caregivers um, related to how they're prompting just to, to develop awareness and then to work on prompt dependency. 
And if you're interested in learning more about a prompt hierarchy, you can look on um, the internet, um, Google prompt hierarchy. You will see that uh, I think um, the most, the highest level, or the lowest level of prompt is someone that can just respond to a verbal prompt. Um, but right below it is visual. Both of those levels of prompt occur very regularly in the natural environment. So we're always trying to shape learners in that direction. Um, too often, again, staff use requests and make demands that result in refusal. And this one is a biggie. Um, I, I know often that it's an access, I would say that learners sometimes by refusing access more attention related to error correction in my experience. And so I'm often looking at the prompt hierarchy and saying, how can you change the environment so this child will be able to know what the next step is without telling, you, telling them what to do. And it could be as simple as a model prop. So, and one that I do a lot is um, have someone pat a chair um, just, to, just to prompt sitting down without giving a, giving a, making a request or making, placing a demand on the learner. And, and then you can reinforce that. Oh, you sat down, great job. If you wanna use a verbal um, reinforcer, you wanna reinforce it with a descriptive verbal praise. Um, uh, visual prompts also really um, allow me to help um, caregivers understand that we're using indirect methods of prompting. And that really fosters self-determination and it really fosters choice too. Uh, because there's a big difference between you telling someone to do do something and someone seeing that you've offered them a choice to sit down and they sit down and so you tend not to get into a situation um, where they're being told over and over and over again and it this is not a behavior analytic word the word power struggle but um, I'm pretty sure folks that are listening today may have an understanding of what I mean that basically what that means depending on the age and um, circumstances of the learner. The learner's not engaging because they're being told what to do continually. So um, music visuals is a really powerful way of changing the environment so that you're not always making those requests in the same manner. I'm gonna go to the next one, Rachel. So this is just a really example, a really um, clear example of the kind of things that we're subject to, right? And I, I also tell people when you talk about visuals, and we're going to talk really specifically pretty soon with Dr. White about um, how to make visuals, some of the simpler visuals, and have examples of visuals. But I wanted to just say a little bit today about know that sometimes the visuals in the environment get very exciting for learners um, and maybe prompt behaviors. Um, and you're unaware of it. And because we are inundated with visuals all the time, um, television, media, but these are just things from magazines that I took. Um, obviously, it's a really weird to see Paris Hilton um, selling a hamburger, I think that is, but it's an example of something that's out there that the learner might be exposed to to prompt a specific behavior. And, and sometimes, just like um, visuals are more immediate for learners in relation to learning in a structured setting. Visuals are more immediate for learners when they're out in the community and they can be prompting uh, a behavior that you're not quite ready for. So sometimes exposing learners to visuals and doing a, a teaching protocol related to them, like going to the supermarket and walking by advertisements for highly preferred things or things that are paired with, say, Disney characters or things like that. Um, maybe something you need to be aware of and something you can practice with the learner, what, how they respond to when they see something like that. Um, and another example, just really good examples that we see every day, you know, the handicap sign, the men sign, the women sign for the restrooms, things like that. Go on to the next one. This is an example of um, a hand washing task analysis that is also visual. And it's pretty simple. I've used it a couple of times. 
um, in different situations. I've also built a visual like this for a client um, who wanted to take pictures of every step, of him doing every step, and we built a little, a little flip chart for him. And he really loved that. He loved seeing himself do it. Sometimes some caregivers really like to do that with their kids. Uh, but this is just a really simple example that helps. Um, this can be, really, can be really hard to figure out what the visual would be. But here's one example, a visual of, for hand washing. Every step that you would like to see. Next, please. This is one that... Um, this is a template I stole from Pinterest, uh, and the reason I stole it is because I like the idea of inserting the learner's picture and inserting a visual of the task. So right now, this is a youngster, I think he's 10. Mom and the youngster together are picking, they're picking the different tasks, and then they're putting little pictures of him in at every level and then they will use stickers, visual stickers, for his completing the task depending on the day, of week, uh, the day of the week. So you can see this teaches a lot of things. Um, it teaches them the day, it works on the day of the week, it works on task completion, and it also works on self-monitoring. So it, there's a lot of things going on here that you're not saying, um, instead the learner can, the learner can access them immediately once they've learned um, the routine chart. And I think one more. And so for now we're going to move on to Rachel and she's going to look through the following, um, a first then board, uh, a visual schedule, um, rules and behavioral expectations. And those can be very important visual supports. Um, to deal with <laughs> not over prompting, not over verbal prompting, um, using visuals for redirection, using visuals to offer choice. And I haven't mentioned um, too much in my discussion about learners that um, have challenges with, um, with talking or with verbal vocal behavior, um, but visuals can be key in communication. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. White will talk more about that. And then task analysis, and then social stories for learning um, more social activities. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much. You are welcome. All right, so basically, um, we're gonna walk through a bunch of different examples. Um, I'm gonna share some um, experiences I have had with each of these. And Summer, if you have examples as we go through for each different set. Um, and then there should be plenty of time for questions or to for you guys to remind us of ones that we didn't include because visual supports are such a huge area. Um, we're just going to touch upon some of the maybe more common ones. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is a first then board and I would say that this is probably one of the simplest visual supports that you might use for a learner who is as an early learner is just understanding schedules, um, learning to follow instructions, learning to wait for things. Um, the idea, and, and after this slide, I have a picture of one, so um, you'll get to see what the picture is, what they look like. Um, but the idea would be pretty simple, either two columns or two icons or two squares or something. Um, you could use pictures, you could use icons from like PEX or BoardMaker or Google has tons of icons. Um, you could use words. Word, printed word is still a visual support. Um, or for learners that may um, not understand any of those representations yet, you might use um, objects or um, uh, either the object itself or an object that is related to the task. Um, so, for example, an object one, if I wanted um, my learner to uh, first do their um, tracing, I'm just making stuff up, first trace and then, um, and then color, then I might have a pencil 
in the first column. I'm trying to do it reverse for you. Pencil in the first column and a crayon in the second column. So first um, trace, then color, and have a pencil and a crayon to represent those. Um, there's only two things for a first then board. We're keeping it really simple. And the idea is that you are spelling it out in that way. First this, then that. Um, and as short a um, phrase as possible, um, if you're saying it. Um, Summer touched upon it where sometimes we're going to have to give the spoken instruction along with the visual so that they can learn. We may also need to provide some physical assistance so that they can learn what that visual means, but then we can fade out the spoken and the physical prompting and the visual itself can help um, the learner to be successful in that situation. Um, so if you do have the vocal presentation or the instructions, you would keep it really simple. So first trace, then color, instead of first we're going to trace your name on your worksheet, then we're going to color the picture orange. Um, because presumably if your learner needs the visual to help understand task completion before getting what they want, then that extra vocal language is probably not going to be very helpful. Um, it could evoke more problem behavior because they're just hearing more and more instructions that may be beyond what they're um, able to receptively understand at that point. Um, another good thing about a first then board is that you can just tap it <laughs> when you like, when the kid, you know, gets off task, you can just tap the first column and then when they complete the task, you can take that on and go to the next one. Now this, then this, and you don't have to continually vocally repeat yourself because you can use the board to repeat the instruction if you need it. Um, so examples for this. In our preschool, this is something that we use a lot um, where we'll grab like two icons um, and say first this, then that, or um, or use two objects because the objects oftentimes in the classroom it's really easy to just grab a couple of objects so first write your name then go play and so we have like a marker and we have the toy that they wanted um, so that would be an example of a first then board um, in the chat um, anybody uh, how about just a, a yes if you've used first then boards before. We'll see how many people are familiar with some of these as we talk through them. So if you've used a first then board before, just type yes into the chat. Great, a couple people have, excellent. A first then board is a really good start for some of the other visual schedule systems. So here are a couple of pictures. Um, on the left hand side you'll see first and then and then it's just blank. You could put an object there, you could write the word, you could draw a little picture, um, you could place an icon on there. Um, just it's very flexible. A lot of times um, we have one of these uh, that we use for one learner. It's laminated and we just dry erase on top of it and we write whatever it is that we need or we draw a little picture if it's a word that the kid's not familiar with. Um, and then we can mark it out when it's done. And then, you know, so when the, the first column is done, we mark it out or we erase it. And then they can go to the then column. And then when they complete that, we can erase that and we can do the next one. Um, the picture on the right uh, shows just uh, an example of the icon. So first the cafeteria, then we go to the playground. And that would be more along the lines of like the schedule. Like first we have to go to lunch before we can go out to the playground for recess. All right. 
So, um, like I said, the first then board is a really good introduction to building up to a visual schedule. Um, when we talk about visual schedules, um, we they can take quite a few different, um, they can look quite a few different ways. Um, they could use pictures or icons. Um, they could use objects uh, like our first then board. Um, they could be written and uh, or electronic. And written and electronic would probably be the ones that are most natural within the larger community. Um, I know I make a list in the morning of what I need to get done. Uh, today and I know I keep an electronic Google Calendar and you guys all got a link for this video uh, for this webinar through um, through the calendar so presumably you also use it at least in occasions um, where it's necessary um, and that would be an example of a visual schedule um, my calendar I have things um, color-coded uh, by what kind of activity it is um, or uh, the location so that I can at a glance see, am I gonna be out in the valley all day? Do I have to um, eat my lunch in my car because I'm driving from Anchorage to the valley? Or am I going back and forth? Am I gonna be in one location for the whole day? Um, so again, it could take a variety of different, uh, it can, it, you can use a variety of different materials. It could look a variety of different ways. Um, the idea would be that you want to find something that the learner understands and prefers. Um, I know working with um, older teens and transitioning into adulthood, sometimes we're working with them, we're like, oh yeah, just use this Google Calendar, it's great. And they don't want to you know they would rather have a paper calendar and that's fine if that works for them and they're able to do it or vice versa we're trying i know when i was um when i was in school my dad kept trying to get me to use like a day planner to keep all of my appointments and it was because he wasn't quite as techno uh technologically savvy. Um, I was like, no, I already have a system. <laughs> it works. I don't want to write it out on a day planner. I, I have an electronic system that works for me. So find what works for your learner and what they prefer, because if they prefer it, then they're more likely to reference it and use it versus if it's a challenge to use, they're not going to reference it and it's not going to be helpful. Um, it is similar um, to a first then board, except it's more than two activities and they occur in the order that you want the learner to proceed through them. So um, it could be that there's only three things, so first, next, and then, um, or it could be a sequence for the whole day. Um, one of the things that you can do with a visual schedule um, and that would be preferable would be to mark it off in some fashion when it's finished. Um, so if you go into the Anchorage School District, um, some of the life skills and structured learning classrooms have visual schedules on the, um, on the wall for their learners. And so it'll have the learner's name and then it'll have um, icons velcroed in and they start at the top and it's like morning circle and then um, and then it's a purple dot for going to the literacy center and then it's um, a icon for speech for going to speech and then it's a green dot for going to the math center and they go through their day and once um, the the teacher will tell them go check your schedule they'll pull off the one that's on top and they put it um they can do one of two things I, i've seen it both ways they can either pull it off and put it in um like a container right next to their schedule or they can pull it off and take it with them and match it or put it in a container when they arrive at the location um, and then it can serve as a 
as a visual reminder of where I'm supposed to be walking right now. Oh, I have purple. I should be going to the purple table as opposed to I pull it off and I put it away and I have no idea what I was supposed to do now. You know, you walk into a room and you don't remember what you're, where you're going. Um, so it could be that they take it with them and, and take it to where it's supposed to be. Um, you could also, if it's not Velcro or if it's Velcro, you could move it from the first to the finished side or the to do to the finished side. Um, you could mark it off. If it's dry erase, you can, um, one of the most satisfying things for me when I do a, a task list of what I need to do is scratching it off. So I like to write out my to-do lists of like, okay, I've got three hours. I got to get these things done. I like to handwrite those because it's satisfying for me to mark it off when it's done. And then to have a paper with just a bunch of scribbles on it is, is satisfying for me. So you might mark it off. You might erase it if it's dry erase, but in some way mark that it's complete. That way you could also do check marks. I mean, anything just to show where you are in your day. Um, referencing back to the electronics, my Google Calendar, it has the time and the time bar goes throughout the day. And once a scheduled activity is complete, it fades that color. So the to-do uh, upcoming items are brighter and the finished um, completed past items are duller. So that could be another way that you would do it. Um, so here's an example on the left um, is a morning schedule. Today is Tuesday, I'm going to school, and here's all the steps to get ready. So wake up, make bed, wash face, and this one goes left to right in two different lines. So left to right, top line, left to right, bottom line. Um, this might be great as far as this order goes for someone that is learning to read or getting um, familiar with the process of left to right English language uh, reading. Um, if it was a different language that went in a different order, then you could do it in that order. Um, the picture on the right is an example of one of those uh, schedules that starts at the top and goes down to the bottom. And you'll see that there's a blue envelope at the bottom. So they take one off and they put it in and that says all done. And so when they finish everything, then they have completed it, but they get to peel it off each time. Um, an example of a visual schedule that I have used um, with one learner, well, with more than one learner, but one learner in particular that I'm thinking of, um, we taught basically a leisure activity schedule. Um, and we had a shelf that had, um, I don't know, five or six um, plastic buckets, uh, like Rubbermaid bins, um, shoebox size. And they were clear and they had an activity in them that the learner could do independently. Um, so things like stringing beads or um, doing a puzzle um, or I'm trying to think what some of the others, Legos, um, Mr. Potato Head. Um, and basically what we did was we, when it was time for the learner to be independent, um, and or play by themselves. The, the, the nature of the why we were teaching this is that this was a learner that if left alone would engage in aberrant behavior. So somebody always had to be in the same room and keep this person occupied because if nobody was actively keeping them busy, then they engaged in problem behavior. So we were trying to come up with a way where they could stay actively busy without someone having to direct what they should go to next so that caregivers could step away and make dinner or do laundry or just not do anything for a few minutes um, without uh, the learner engaging in problem behavior. Um, so these were all tasks that the learner knew, but the learner didn't independently select tasks to engage in. If someone gave him a task, he would engage in the task, um, but not for very long. 
and he wouldn't independently select these tasks. So we did this activity schedule. So when it was time for him to play by himself, um, and that was the, the words that we use, okay, play by yourself. And then mom would um, point to the schedule on the wall. We did have a vertical one and we did um, the Velcro uh, pictures. We, we took pictures with the camera and shrunk them down so that they match. Um, so he would pull off one, he would walk over to the, uh, the shelf, which was not very far away, it was pretty close, and find the, um, find the box with the matching picture. So it was picture to picture matching and stick it to the box, take the box down to the table, which was all right there. So he could do this like right at the dining room table, um, open up the box, engage with that activity for a while. Um, we tried to pick things that had a definite end. So like the puzzle has a definite end. You're done with beads when they're all on the string or the pipe cleaners. Um, the Legos, um, they were they were larger ones, and we had like three pictures of different things, so like a house and a, um, a tree and I don't know, something else, but just some shapes, and he could match all of those because he was great with matching skills. Um, and then when he was done, put it back on the shelf and go back to the schedule. And that way, we taught him to independently move through um, several leisure activities without someone having to tell him or give him the next leisure activity to entertain him for two or three or four minutes at a time. So by taking out somebody having to um, verbally instruct or physically give him an item by putting it on the schedule, we could have him playing independently for 30 minutes because we had five different, five or six different um, two, three, four minute activities that he could do, which meant that now you've got a 30 minute chunk of time, which allows you to make some dinner, get some laundry, rest, go to the bathroom, whatever it is, allow the caregiver longer periods of time instead of only getting two, three, four minute, um, minutes at a time. So that would be an example of how I have used a visual schedule before. Uh, Summer, did you have any examples you would like to share? There we go. Um, there we go. Um, not right now, but I, I just, I want to reiterate. I think giving caregivers enough time is um, probably the number one thing that makes it more likely that caregivers make visual <laughs> schedules. Um, they really help when you've got a kid that needs to move from thing to thing. So I, thanks for that example, Rachel. Yeah, no problem. And then for those of you that can use the group chat, have you guys used visual schedules before? Or is that something that's new to you or something that you'd love to try? So yes, you've used it never used it or you're considering maybe trying it or maybe you're not considering trying it who knows <laughs> it may not be um what would be most beneficial for your particular learner or particular situation all right I am going to go on to the next one, but if you have any comments about visual schedules, please feel free to share those with the group. So visual supports can also be used to give the rules or the behavioral expectations for a particular situation. Um, now I would say that this may be um, the broadest category that we're going to talk about as far as what materials might be helpful um, because they can kind of go from really small to really big. Um, so it could be that it's just an icon reminder or a note card um, that lists out what the, what the steps or the expectations are. Um, it could be a more detailed written checklist as to what um, what the expectations are for that situation, 
or referencing back to um, Summer's example of a kindergarten classroom, it could be the giant poster on the wall that has the rules for um, when you're in school. Uh, raise your hand, uh, listen when the teacher's talking, those kinds of things. Um, so this is one that, especially if we're thinking visual posters, um, this is one that is something that you'll see in areas um, within the community. Um, so it's been a while since I've been to like a sporting event, but at least in some of the facilities I've been to, they'll have some of those rules posted um, when you come through the gate or when you're entering. Things like whether or not alcohol is allowed at this sporting event. Um, if, uh, well, that's the only thing I can think of right now for a second, but um, <laughs> the list of some of the expectations. Um, also, certain venues might have dress codes um, that they enforce for particular events. Um, so no sunglasses or no weapons or things like that. Um, and those might be listed and that would serve as a list of rules or behavioral expectations for that venue. Um, and they're posted there so that everybody that walks through has has seen them. Um, whether or not they attended to them may be a different story, but they are posted as a reminder. Um, when you're going through uh, airport security, TSA, they have visuals where they have the no this and the no this and the yes okay three ounces. Um, they have visuals there. Um, and, uh, but as far as like small note card things, um, it might also be that you uh, just have like a little icon or a little flash card that if your learner is starting to um, maybe get too loud in a particular environment, you could show them the flash card. Or a lot of the schools do like the volume level, like this is a five, four, three, two, we should be at a one right now, or um, we should be at a two voice volume. Um, those might be the same kind of thing that just remind you as to what the rules should be right now. Um, the idea is that you're reminding um, or telling ahead of time, uh, using a pre-correct, the expectations for the setting. Uh, it should be short and simple. Um, again, if this is gonna be a visual cue, we want this to serve a little bit more as the reminder or a refresher, not necessarily the whole lesson. Um, and we, sh we do want to phrase it, especially if you are writing things out, um, phrase it in the positive, saying walk instead of don't run. Um, by phrasing in the positive, we're telling our learners what we want them to do, not letting them figure out what we want them to do by telling them what not to do. Um, don't run doesn't mean that I can't skip. So now I'm skipping, but that's not walking. That's not what I wanted, but they're still following the rule. Um, the other thing about phrasing things in the positive is um, if I say, don't think of an elephant, possibly the first visual picture that just popped in your head was an elephant. And that's what I told you don't think of, as opposed, as opposed to if I were to say, think of a kangaroo, think of a giraffe, think of a seal, all of those things. Now you're engaging in the behavior that I want you to engage in instead of focusing on what not to do. Um, and these are reviewed prior to their use. Um, then you can point to them or hold it out or, um, you know, show the flashcard or give the symbol um, in order to remind the learner. Um, but just, you know, doing this doesn't mean anything if you haven't been taught that this means you need to lower your voice to a whisper. So these should be, uh, much like any behavioral expectation, should be taught prior to the opportunity to practice the skill and then use the visual to cue or remind how to um, engage in the setting. 
And so here is our little visual example of classroom rules. Um, stay in my seat, use my listening ears, hands in my lap, eyes on the teacher. So those are the expectations and they've got words and they've got icons and presumably this is in um, a, a position that is very easily noticed by the learners. Um, Summer, anything to add on this one? Sorry, I think I have to unmute you apparently. It's not letting me try it now. There we go. All I think, right. <laughs> okay. I think I'm unmuted. Um, I think that the one thing about visuals, and I'm as I'm looking at the classroom rules, it are that in each situation, I talked a little bit about modeling, um, where I've seen the classroom rules and the visual schedules be the most effective is there's a lot of modeling and practice with learners. Um, as I look at this, uh, it, it's explicit in most of the pictures, but um, practice and reinforce the behaviors that you're using for the visual schedules so that you're sure that the learner um, associates the visual with the actual behavior or the activity that you're um, planning them to use the visual for because sometimes um, they're not explicit enough or the learner just doesn't they don't remember um, and so I, I have seen that happen um, and then the other thing is uh, teach the other people working with the learner how to use your visual schedules so don't um, don't assume because I've seen them used in some really different ways. And uh, the, only, the only comment I think is that everybody understands, understands and has a clear understanding of how you're using the visuals and what they mean. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, and, and the point about teaching, I mean, the idea should be that the learner is being taught um, in a uh, context that is most appropriate for the learner to learn the expectations and the visuals are then cueing or reminding not doing the teaching themselves. If I were to, um, if I wanted to teach you uh, Japanese characters um, and I just stuck up the Japanese character and said, okay, do this you wouldn't be able to do that because you don't know what that visual character means. You don't know, understand what the marks mean. So you have to be taught what it means and then you can use that visual to be successful and display the correct behavior. Um, let's see, example of expectations. Um, I've done this with my kids before uh, where I will um, you know write out what the expectations are that's why I say note cards because I always grab like index cards three by five index cards and write on them um, write out what the uh, expectations are and then um, if they're not following the expectations then I can just point to the card or show them the card. Um, so sitting in church, being an example, um, sitting still, being quiet, um, not distracting the other people, so keeping your hands to yourself, not raising your hands up here, keeping your hands down in your lap, those kinds of things um, that we might use to, to remind our learners of what the expectations are. Any thoughts from our group as far as behavior expectations and rules? Have you guys used visuals with, um, with in this kind of a setting before? I mean, in this kind of a modality before? Um, or is this something that you are thinking about trying? Visual social stories, great, yeah, and we're gonna get to social stories, but if you go through the social story, then you can use some of those visuals, pull them out separate to remind them in the situation that you use the social story for. Very good. 
um, on the tables in the classroom, yes, having some of that stuff that's just right there where every kid, they each have it um, where they can see it. It's right there to remind them what the expectations are so they don't have to scan the room to find it. Excellent. Great examples. All right. Um, redirection. So similar to the uh, behavior behavioral expectations and rules, um, once a challenging or disruptive or problematic behavior is occurring, um, if you can use, and Summer spoke about this, if you can use a, a visual cue to redirect to the appropriate activity, then that may be less likely to um, evoke more problem behavior. So as far as materials go, this is definitely one where hand signals are, are helpful um, because you have it with you at all times. So you don't have to look for a particular icon um, when there's something uh, happening at this moment, when there's something that could escalate that's happening at the moment. Um, just like in the other examples, this is something you would need to teach beforehand so that they would understand what that redirection meant. Um, but if you have a learner who's out of their seat, just tapping on the chair, and that's been paired with come sit before, just tapping on the chair might be enough to cue and redirect them to come back to their seat without having to give that vocal instruction, which could be beneficial for a couple of reasons. One, if the teacher is teaching, I can deliver a visual cue to one learner to get them back on task. I can tap their chair while still talking to the rest of the class. Um, so I can continue to do what else I need to do in that setting. Also, this is less attention. Tapping a chair is less attention to an inappropriate behavior that could be attention seeking. Um, my own, my youngest is definitely um, attention seeking. And so using a lot of hand signals and visual cues to get her back on track with what she's supposed to be doing is helpful because if you talk about it, then she continues to be more dramatic about it. Or if you give an instruction vocally, then she's going to definitely try and do the opposite of whatever you just said versus if I point to the bathroom because she's supposed to be in the bathroom getting ready, it's not as obvious what an opposite of that would be. <laughs> At least she hasn't figured that out yet. So she's she is more likely to follow through. She's less likely to become more um, dramatic or intense in her problem behavior. Um, it should be a simple, quick reminder, a one-step instruction. This isn't, um, this isn't a big complicated thing because they're already off, so we need something simple and quick to bring them back. And then you might move back into something else. So Summer's example of tapping the chair would be great. Tapping the chair, now they're back in the chair. Now I can continue with a more complex task or skill that I'm expecting at that point. Um, if you have a visual, a signal, or a gesture, or some icon, then you can just reference that. Um, and what I found, and, and my background is um, primarily with learners with autism um, and, and my own kids, um, but I find that it's harder for someone to argue with a visual than it is to argue with your vocal instruction. So at least at that level, you're not gonna get into a screaming match because there's only one person that may be upset or yelling. There's not somebody trying to give directions over someone who's already being loud. Um, and it, you can't one up each other because you're just referencing back to a visual. So it can only, you know, it only can get to kind of this level. Um, Summer, do you have something to share on those? Nope. All right. I want to make sure I'm giving you an opportunity. Um, so a couple of examples here as far as like visual picture cards um, could be uh, 
for example, there's the ring clip. When I'm frustrated, I can, and then there's a whole lot of options for that learner or maybe a sequence for them to engage in. Um, the one on the right uh, has icons so that the person referencing it can find it, but then they can just hold up the one icon. Um, what I do a lot of times with hand signals is just you know, point to things or do gestures with, you know, like uh, lower your volume by doing the little hand and getting it lower or, or actually I do this one, like I do like a pincher, fingers together, uh, I'm trying to describe it for you guys on the phone indexed and thumb and I make it big like a little alligator and then like make it smaller and and both of my kids know that that means to get quieter um because we've taught that um we have a question how do you create quick simple visual prompts um google and pinterest are really helpful um you can uh you you can do a quick search for icon quiet and you will probably have a few things pop up um if you're looking for um icons that may be specific to certain language systems um like pex and board maker are examples of programs that you could purchase their specific licensed um materials from um usually not too expensive I think now since you know Google and Pinterest exist um, it really depends upon the learner what kind of detail you would need if your learner can read um, you can just write things on sticky notes um, or index cards and use that um, I have one parent we're doing some parent training with that um, she's been using a visual schedule for getting ready in the morning and she'll write the word because one of her kids can read and she'll draw like a little stick figure picture on on a dry erase board or she'll draw something so it's like brush teeth and she draws like a little squiggly toothbrush um and she says like i don't think that i'm doing a very good job drawing it i'm like if you're using the same thing over and over again it really doesn't matter it could just be a, a blob it could be an ink spot it could be any kind of symbol um if you're pairing it then you're teaching what that symbol would look like um so i would say you know you might just do a an internet image search and print out a couple of things and um if you feel like you need something sturdy i think the examples that i have here might be laminated things uh you can do the old school lamination where we stuck it to a note card and then got the big uh packing tape and just did some layers of packing tape clear packing tape over it to make it a little sturdy so you don't have to like officially laminate things um, because sometimes we just have that pile build up of all the things that we need to laminate um, so that might be a quick way to do that so I hope that's helpful for you great all right um, so the next one would be a choice board. Um, so Summer kind of talked about this a little bit at the end, um, where some of our learners communicate themselves using visual icons or visual representations. Um, for learners that have like an AAC or a device or a voice output device, um, they may use it there, but the idea is often that it's there's icons and there's visuals for the learner to use um, and identify the visuals um, to be able to get their wants and needs met. So along a similar line of thinking is that having a choice board for when there are options um, can be a visual easy way for the learner to know what's available and what's not available and to present that there is a choice for them to make as opposed to a schedule that goes in order where they know they need to go to the next one you um, a, a choice board you'd want it to look a little bit different so that it's clearer like this is a have to do and this is a want to do kind of a situation 
Um, so the materials, again, could be uh, anything along the same lines. It could be words, pictures, objects, icons. Um, great example of this in the natural environment are menu boards and menus um, when you go to restaurants. I am personally a big fan of restaurants that put pictures in with their written words on their menu so that I can see what the food's going to look like. Um, so I know whether I want to try it or not. Um, but even the written menu is still, it's an example of a choice board. What is available to choose from? Um, and, uh, or when you go to like McDonald's, they'll have things written and they have lots of the pictures up there so that um, people can see what's available um, and what they can select from. Um, instead of trying to list everything, because think about it, if we didn't use visuals and you went into McDonald's <laughs> and you didn't know what they served or what they had, how many things would somebody have to list for you? Um, I mean, I don't even know how much stuff they have on their menu. It's not just burgers and fries or nuggets. So there's a lot more options. So visually presenting those things saves somebody from having to repeat the list. Um, when you go to restaurants, I, this reminds me of a little bit, but you go to restaurants and you and they say, oh, the chef's special or the soup of the day or the blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you ask your server, oh, what's the special or what's, you know, what's the thing that's not on the menu? Um, and they sit there and they're like, da 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 <laughs> You know, they have to like, they take the breath. They're like, okay, say this again for the 45th time. It's not necessarily... Um, a fun task to repeat all of the choices. Um, I do the same thing. I uh, actually, I don't have a choice board um, like with pictures and stuff, but for breakfast in the morning with my daughter, I will just pull out like three or four of the breakfast choices and set them on the counter because I don't want to have to keep saying them. And then her say, well, wait, what was the first one? Um, or, you know, what is it? The, the, how many flavors of ice cream does, Baskin Robbins have right 31 or 20 something anyway all the flavors like you don't want to go through all of the flavors and then have to go back and start over we need the person to be able to see what those choices were so that they can remember um, you can also layer choice boards uh, so one of the learners that I work with we have um, uh, on break um, when it's your free choice, there's like seven or eight things that they can choose from. One of them is songs and music. Um, if they select songs and music and give that icon, then we have another board that has like 12 different songs that this learner has liked in the past. And, um, and then they can select which particular song because for this learner, um, they're not able to describe what song they want, but YouTube, you can take a little screenshot of the, um, of the, the picture that comes up and the name of it, and then um, shrink that down and make that be a choice. So now our learner can select which um, song they want by the picture on the screen and the picture on the YouTube that would show up. And our staff, our providers, can find the one that they want because it's got the words typed in there and the screenshot. So they find exactly the right version that this learner likes. Um, but that would be an example of like layering it. So they say, oh, I want to um, have a snack, and then you have a, an additional snack choice board. Or I want to listen to a song, and you have an additional song and music choice board. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, generally speaking, present it in a different array than what you would do for your visual schedule. So if your visual schedule is a vertical strip, then maybe your choice board is horizontal or it's um, you know got several of them all over and it's not just one column going down um, so that the learner can discriminate between the things that they get to choose whichever one and they don't have to go in order versus the one where they have to go in order and i see somebody just made a choice board so that is awesome 
Um, <coughs> choice boards are fantastic for helping our learners to see what the options are. And like I said, we do it all the time with menus. Um, here are a couple of pictures of examples. Um, these, I, I have to say, are a bit more um, neat and organized than what I usually pull out. <laughs> um, but the idea is that you have the icons. Um, they can then put it on a sentence strip which may make sense for a learner who's already using some sort of sentence strip in their um, alternative communication, um, PEX being an example. Um, or um, they could give the icon to somebody else. Um, also, like I said, it doesn't have to be icons. I know that I'm presenting pictures of a lot of icons because that is something that a lot of people use and can be very happy. Or, be very uh, easy to implement, um, but you could take pictures of the items or activities of the choices, um, or you could use objects. Like I said, for breakfast with my daughter, I just lay out the box of cereal, the box of oatmeal, and the box of Pop-Tarts, and then she can choose which one she wants. Um, one learner that we did um, a choice board with, actually, it ended up being like a, a choice um, coupon filing book, and basically, almost like a Rolodex. I think if we had had access to a Rolodex, we probably would have turned it into a Rolodex. Um, but we took pictures, I think I talked about this last time, we took pictures of her engaging in the activity, so instead of having an icon, because that didn't mean as much to her, there was a picture of her on the swing, her on the slide, her playing with Barbies. And so then she would look for her picture and she was really fluent with it. Like I said, we kept them in like a, a note card coupon box and there were probably like 45 different pictures in there. And she'd go through and she'd find which one she wanted real quick. So there's a lot of different ways that you could present that choice. Um, Summer, have you uh, anything to add to the choice board discussion? All right. Um, and I did see a comment that somebody just started a choice board um, a couple of days ago. Anybody else have experiences with choice boards or maybe a different variation um, than what we've discussed? I get to drink a, a, some water every time I pause and ask you guys questions. So that's why I'm asking lots of questions. <laughs> yes, Summer. Oh, um, there we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I just wanted to say um, I've used a choice board also for chores, um, sometimes giving uh, chore choices has been really effective using a visual that way. So it doesn't have to be um, a reinforcer, right? An activity based on complete. I use it for chores um, and they all have to be used, but, and they all eventually go away in a week, but they get to pick what, what they do each day. Um, and that's been pretty effective versus, versus a verbal prompt to do chores. Right. Excellent. No, that's a good idea um, and, and a good uh, difference that we haven't talked about. It could be selecting what to do next. So it could be kind of in conjunction with your visual schedule. So visual schedule says, now it's time for chores. And then here's your chore selection. And maybe you can choose to do three of the five. So maybe you can avoid some of them, or maybe you just get to select what kind of order you do them in, which ones you want to start with first um, versus which ones you want to end. Yeah, great example. Thank you. And I see someone's using uh, choice boards with preschoolers. Yeah, preschoolers uh, may, even though, even if they are vocal, verbal, and um, are learning language, they still may not, you know, know what all the available choices are right now. Um, when I was in graduate school, uh, the preschool program that I, um, worked in for a little while had centers 
but each center could only have like four kids in each center so that they didn't get too big. And therefore you had to, instead of having a teacher go around and say, oh, there's five people, you can't be here, go to this one, go to that one. There was a, a board on the side of one of the bookcases and students would go up and they would pick the shape that they wanted. So they were like shapes and colors. Um, so they were very different. And there'd be four of each shape and it matched with one of the centers. And so when you went up and it was your turn to select, you could see which ones were still available. You could take the one that was still available um, and go to your um, center. And there was a, there was a place to put that um, icon. And then when you left, you took it with you, you put it back up there and you got a different one. Um, and then that way there's no arguing about um, who was there first because you either had the shape or you didn't um, to walk over there and you could see which ones are open right now. And there were definitely kids that got very good at maximizing where they would keep like one corner out of their eye watching a center and then see when somebody's going back with the shape and then they take their shape and be right there for when that person put theirs on to get their turn to go over there. So yeah, different, uh, different examples or ways to use that to see what's available, what's still available, or what to select from. Great. All right. Um, the next one, uh, Summer gave us an example of this earlier, but it, uh, a task analysis. So the task analysis, the materials, again, could be a wide variety of things, whatever's going to be most beneficial for your learner. Um, a task analysis is a breakdown of a complex skill into smaller steps. Um, so things, uh, oftentimes we use task analyses for um, hygiene and self-care kinds of routines, taking a shower, using the restroom, washing your hands, getting dressed. Um, but task analyses are also something that we find in the natural environment, usually in the context of assembling furniture or Lego um, assemblies or um, following a recipe to make something, to bake or to cook something. Um, and those are all um, examples of task analyses. Um, so you would want to identify the steps, but this would be something where your initial instruction might be go wash your hands. And that may be a vocal instruction that is in the natural environment that you plan to give every time, um, but you don't want to then have to stand there with the learner and say, turn on the water, put your hands under the water, get the soap, <laughs> rub your hands together. You don't want to say every step every single time because that individual is not, um, they're not independent at that point. Um, some of these things like shower and restroom then require some invasion of privacy and um, we would love for our learners to be as independent and be able to have that privacy and respect that we would give um, for a, a individual who did not require any supports. So these might be really helpful um, for self-care skills um, that have a lot of steps and we want to make sure that our learner isn't skipping a step, that they're thoroughly completing the task. Um, generally speaking, and you could do it different ways, but generally speaking, these are going to be listed in order, but not necessarily something that you mark off each time so that you're not interrupting the flow of the activity. So for example, if the task is hand washing, um, and I turn on the water and I stick my hands under the water, am I going to then pick up a marker and mark it off um, and then go back to get the soap? That kind of interrupts the chain of the skill. And the idea with a task analysis is that that complex skill should be just a series of these smaller steps to complete one behavior. So generally speaking, um, you would not want this to be a version that gets marked off or that they move icons or things like that um, unless it was deemed that it was really necessary for the learner, um, you know, if they, if they were 
unsure, let's say, for example, in the shower, um, if they were unsure of whether or not they had done particular things, then it might make sense to, you know, provide some sort of way for them to check things as they did it. Um, but if you're talking about using a, a visual support in the shower, you gotta, you definitely need to laminate that one. Um, so uh, here's an example. Um, similar, very similar to the hand washing one that uh, Summer showed us earlier. Um, at our preschool, we have it, um, we actually have it on the mirror so that the kids can't see their faces in the mirror because they tend to play if they can see themselves. So we actually have it on kind of a larger piece of paper right at eye level for our preschoolers. Um, but in our, um, in, in other classrooms, we might have it like right at the bottom of the mirror above the sink so that the learner can see it as they reach there and it's there. And we might even have them point at it in the beginning to go to each step, but that would probably be something that we'd want to fade off um, as well as things go along. Um, important things to remember about task analysis, um, if you are going to represent the steps visually, for so using some sort of visual support, that your visuals, um, each step needs to be a step that the learner can understand. Um, I'm going to use a recipe as an example. Um, so, well, now I'm not going to remember a term. But say I'm following a recipe, and then it says to Julianne the carrots. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. That's not a helpful step for me. I would need you to break it down. I think Julianne is a type of slicing it a certain way. So I would need that step broken down into smaller steps. Um, for example, a hand washing sequence, um, it says soap and it says wash hands, but for another learner, they might need um, a, a longer one that has a few more steps about put the soap, rub together, get the backs of your hands, and then, um, and then rinse it off. Um, it depends upon the skill of the learner. Um, Another example of like needing maybe more detail is if you've tried to put together um, furniture that had maybe like three pictures. Um, I've definitely gotten those and I'm like, okay, wait, I don't even know which way this is oriented. How did you get from here's all the pieces to here's five of them already assembled together? Um, so you wanna make sure that you have the steps uh, detailed to a level that your learner can be successful, that that step is meaningful. Um, but at the same time, you don't want a task analysis visual prompt that goes, you know, wider than your bathroom mirror if that's where they're going to need it. So you'll have to find a balance as to what is going to work for your learner. Um, all right, we'll go to the audience, including uh, Summer. Summer, if you have anything, jump in. And um, those of you in chat, um, have you used uh, task analyses uh, visuals for any of your learners? Summer, did you have anything to expand upon there? Okay. Um, I have definitely used these with, um, I've used them for showers, I've used them for hand washing, for toileting, um, getting dressed, like the sequence of which clothes to put on, um, make sure you don't forget things. Um, trying to think what else as far as task analysis go. Um, visual recipes. Um, there was a presentation at the Full Lives Conference um, that uh, Amy Smith with CESA um, and the ARC gave, um, and they had, she had a lot of um, visual cookbooks, which was really cool to see because they did, they had like icons for the different activities or the different steps of making some, um, some of them were fairly complex uh, recipe books. 
Um, so that was really nice to see that somebody's already put those things together. Um, all right. Social stories. Uh, so somebody mentioned that they had a little bit of experience with social stories, so that's great. Um, social stories are, generally speaking, going to be books with words and pictures that are written to describe to the learner uh, how to engage or how to participate in a setting or what to expect or how to handle certain situations. Um, they're generally written from the learner's perspective. That way the learner can, um, if, they, uh, if they memorize it, let's say, because some of our learners are really great at memorizing things, then it's from their perspective. So the pronoun use would be correct if they're scripting it or if they're using self-talk to walk themselves through what to do in a situation. Um, these might be good for some of that problem solving uh, strategies that the learner is walking themselves through it in the correct frame of how we would talk ourselves through a situation. Um, uh, the behavioral expectations would be for the situation. You'd want to introduce this before the event and repeat it frequently. And then, as was mentioned before, maybe you could use some of those icons or pictures from the social story to remind them once they're in the setting. Um, if you're interested in social stories, Google social stories and you'll find a whole lot of examples. Um, but here is an example here about um, a particular, you know, fancy bound book that somebody has put together. Um, so trying new foods. It's got icons um, and uh, symbols for each word. So learners that might not be fluent with reading could still follow along um, with the picture icons. Um, it's got the sentence written above. It's got a picture. This one is very detailed. Um, this is something that's available on the market somewhere, and um, therefore they're um, trying to uh, present it at a variety of different levels so that um, lots of learners could use it. Um, when I do social stories, oftentimes I just um, sit down and we go over what the expectations are for that situation. So say, for example, I'm preparing my learner to ride an airplane and take a trip. Um, you know, I'll sit down with the caregivers and we'll go over what are the steps to make sure we're not forgetting anything. Um, and then we'll, I'll, I'll type it out in Word and just do Google, you know, image search for um, pictures, uh, icons that might represent that. So I might have an airplane, I might have some icons of, um, of what uh, the security line looks like, or taking pictures from that particular setting. So if I know we're going to be leaving out of the Anchorage airport, then maybe I'll go and take a few pictures. Um, I don't know if they'll let me, but um, <laughs> take some pictures of what the line looks like, what um, the ticket window looks like, those kinds of things. Um, and then we put it in the learner's perspective. Um, so it might be things like um, lots of people go on vacation out of the state of Alaska, um, I'm going on a vacation out of the state of Alaska, and if I have the details of the information on May 25th, right, and put that in there, um, when I go to the airport, I will need to, you know, put my luggage on the luggage conveyor belt. Um, I, the ticket person will give me a ticket. I will hold on to my ticket <laughs> until, um, you know, whatever the next step is, and you spell it out. And then that way, there's a couple of different things. You can either have your learner, like, keep that with them as they go through the event so that they can reference what's coming up next, or you can use those pictures to create, like, um, or words to create reminders of what the next steps are. And prior to this, you have gone over this several times with them so that those pictures would cue them to remember um, the rest of the story that went along with that. Um, anyone want to share social story examples? 
or have you used them? How about? And Summer, do you have anything to add? Um, I wanted to say that one of the things that I use social stories for more than um, more than situations like airport is trying to use something to demonstrate social skills between two learners. Um, and one of the one of the mechanisms I've used is kind of a social story through um, a little bit of comic booky kind of drawing because I tend to work with older learners. So um, if you look at the pictures and the example, I would, I would use that with younger learners, but sometimes those visuals will actually turn off the older learners. They're not as excited by, um, it, it's just overly simple. So I'm always looking for um, comic book strips, um, even things related to superheroes and social stories um, where, um, there's a learning opportunity for the youth to look and read the story and put themselves in the in the place of someone trying to interact with a peer or um, interact with a girl um, or someone of the opposite sex. So, uh, and there's not enough, uh, I'll say, um, material out there for a little bit older youth. But um, one of these days, I'm going to find somebody that will draw social stories in a full comic book form or something like that, because it, it, it's exciting when the youth gets, um, can put themselves into the pictures and see um, the skills that way. Excellent. So. Excellent example. Yeah. Social stories um, can be used for, I mean, basically any kind of a social situation, whether it's a new um, situation um, or uh, using their skills that they can demonstrate in one situation and generalizing those to other settings and other encounters. And yeah, that's a great example of matching your visual to what your learner is going to be motivated to reference. They're not going to be, you know, if they're into graphic novels, they're not going to be motivated to look at um, some of these more simplistic icons, but they might be highly motivated to look at comic strip social stories. So yeah, great example. All right, so to kind of pull things back together and wrap things up, um, using visual supports, you have to teach them, um, not just explain them. So in some of our other uh, sessions, we talked about how to teach some particular skills. Um, we've talked about it here. You've got to pair the instructions um, with prompts that are going to be successful for the learner and pair those with your visual supports so that then your visual supports mean something to the learner. Um, you can't just say these are the rules and have a bunch of icons that don't have any meaning to the learner yet. Um, the prompting, you might be pairing it with spoken instructions. If spoken instructions do um, uh, if spoken instructions do control the behavior or currently the learner is able to follow the spoken instructions and you're trying to fade out how much you're having to talk and tell them and help you're trying to increase their independence. Um, or you may be using some form of physical guidance. Um, oftentimes when I'm doing um, some of those self-help skills where we don't want to have to tell the learner every step, we use the physical guidance to guide them through the steps of hand washing so that then as they're successful with that, the visual is there and they can reference the visual and they never need to have someone tell them that piece. Um, we've also touched upon it um, where it needs to be easy for the learner to use. Um, a complicated visual system is not, they're not going to reference it. We also just talked about it being like preferred. So making sure that the visuals are um, designed in a way that the learner is interested and motivated to reference those visuals, um, that they stand out in the environment somehow um, so that they're salient to that learner. And then Summer mentioned this before, be consistent. Make sure that everyone um, in this learner's life is using those visuals in the same kind of a way, that it's being presented in the same way that the learner understands, um, that everyone is holding the same expectations, um, and that it's consistent across people, across environments, across situations. 
Um, oh, somebody says I use the social story for a doctor's visit. Yeah, that's a great example um, because there's a lot of different things that might come up in a, in a doctor's visit and going over everything beforehand is great. So that is our presentation. I am pasting into our uh, chat, for those of you that are, can see the chat, a link to our satisfaction survey. Um, we would just like your feedback on this topic um, and, uh, and how the presentation went. And um, if you have suggestions for future webinars, we'd appreciate that. This is the last one of this series, um, but we did have good turnout at all of these. So this may be something that we're able to do again um, fairly soon. So just take a couple of minutes to uh, fill out that survey and Summer and I are happy to answer any questions you have or if you just want to share some information about um, things that you have used um, as visual supports or maybe things that we didn't touch upon, we'd be happy to hear from you. And if you would like a copy of the handouts for today's presentation, you can email me to request those, rachel at alaskachd.org. That's rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at alaskachd.org. Or if you have any other questions um, or uh, anything, feel free to contact me. I'm good. Email is the best way to reach me. Um, but my phone number is there. That's my office number, 907-264-6239. Um, Summer, any closing thoughts? I'm trying to unsilence you. There we go. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, just thank you for coming and listening today. Uh, um, the only the only thing I can reiterate, I can't tell you how many classrooms or homes I go into and there's a nice visual schedule and no one's using it. Um, Self-awareness about for caregivers and um, direct support per persons about the fact that we'll go human behavior is um, where is an effect for us and we generally go to the fastest way to communicate for our, ourselves and so sometimes visual schedules don't get used when they're there um, so practice using a visual schedule because it's not always the simplest thing to do if you implement something um, try your best to um, to use it um, consistently because I would say that's probably the most consistent challenge I think caregivers have in the moment going back and using the schedule it might it might slow things down for a while um i think that's probably the one thing i want to add thank you so much for coming and listening um and have a wonderful saturday yeah thank you guys so much thank you summer for presenting and um we'll leave this screen on and chat open um if you haven't already please click on that link in chat so that you can fill out that uh satisfaction survey and let us know how we did um and i'll leave my contact information up so that if you need a um if you need to email me or contact me for anything or would like a copy of the handouts please feel free thank you guys